and a warm welcome to one slot. Let's begin. Twice in 1960, in his addresses in August and October 1st, Nigeria's former Prime Minister, Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, declared Africa as the centerpiece of Nigeria's foreign policy. The doctrine of Afrocentrism is predicated on the supposed manifest leadership role placed in Nigeria by nature in terms of its size and population and focuses on several fundamental principles, African unity and independence, capability to exercise, if you please, dominant influence in the region, peaceful settlement of disputes, non-alignment and non-intentional interference in the internal affairs of other nations and regional economic cooperation and development. Now, the principles of Nigeria's foreign policy and its Afrocentrism has consistently operated by the government of the country. According to some scholarly summation, the benefit of Nigeria's Afrocentric policy has enormously assisted the country's image internationally. On today's program, we will be reviewing the impact of this Afrocentric foreign policy. My guest, Ambassador Joe Kashi, among his many roles, is a retired permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a diplomat for 34 years who has served in Togo, Ethiopia, Belgium, the Netherlands, Namibia, Syria alone, where he participated as a facilitator in the negotiations that ended the 10 years of civil war, and the United States of America, where he served as the Consul General of Nigeria based in Atlanta. Widely traveled, Ambassador Kashi is a recipient of many international and local awards, including the Officer of the Other of the Niger OON, conferred on him by the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It's a pleasure to welcome you to one slot. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank, thank you for having me and uh, Happy New Year to you and uh, all your listeners. Thank you. Happy New Year. Some say there's been a shift. But let me ask, how truly Afrocentric is Nigeria's foreign policy? To a large extent, it is uh, very, very Afrocentric. And uh, you can understand and appreciate the reason for that. Uh, perhaps the, 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 the first main reason is the fact that we are within the continent of Africa. And as such, we cannot pursue any other policy that is not, uh, that, that, uh, that is not uh, defensive of Africa, that is not defensive of Nigeria's uh, interests. And so when you also add the issue of the fact that we are the, the, the largest in this part of the world, again, we have no choice but to bear that in mind. And uh, now we also have the largest uh, economy. So that makes, it that makes it almost inevitable that not only uh, should our foreign policy be Afrocentric, but more especially that we also serve as the voice of the continent, particularly as we got a number of uh, issues. And I think this we've done very well in the past when we took up quite a number of uh, issues uh, in pursuit of our foreign policy. Let's talk about some of the principles guiding the foreign policy of Nigeria, and amongst them is the peaceful settlement of dispute, non-alignment, and non-intentional interference in the international, internal rather, affairs of other nations, and of course, the regional economic cooperation and development. In all of these air guiding areas, how much of an inroad would you say we have made? Oh, a, uh, a lot, considerable. First thing you need to realize was um, the period, the period in which some of these policies or principles uh, were enunciated by the, by the prime minister. We were just young, independent African nation, and uh, 
we, we, it was also a period of the Cold War in which we were either aligned to, uh, to the Soviet Union at that time, or you were aligned to the West. And uh, we chose to be non-aligned, which gives us the leeway, you know, to be able to deal effectively with both sides. And in terms of the peaceful settlement of, uh, you know, crisis, also we have just joined the United Nations and certainly we cannot, uh, you know, but be, um, uh, but be guided by the principles of the United Nations which also believe in the peaceful settlement of crisis. And of course, they, they, uh, and so in being non, uh, uh, and the, the most, uh, the, the last part of your question is uh, in terms of, um, uh, regional I believe, regional peace and, and, uh, and uh, stability and cooperation. Uh, and here, I think we did a lot because um, we did the best we could to maintain peace with uh, our neighbors. And um, as of today, in spite of uh, some provocations, you could see that Nigeria continues to behave very maturely in terms of dealing with its, uh, with its neighbors. Uh, in the early 60s and 70s and parts of the 80s, if you look at all history, I mean, all uh, books on Nigerian diplomatic uh, engagement, you'll find these, these, these words, um, uh, good neighborliness. You know, good neighborliness was what we, we, we enunciated and promoted in terms of our relationship with, uh, with, with our neighbors. And of course, immediately after the uh, Civil War, based on the lessons of the Civil War, we intensify our diplomatic practice around the world. And then uh, we also strengthen the mechanism for the implementation of our foreign policy and ensure that uh, we have the capacity the capacity to engage the world as much as we can. And I believe that we did that uh, considerably well too. Yeah, what, what will be some of the impact you can identify that these foreign policy has had in Africa as a whole? Are there some that you can identify readily and say these are some of the impact that Nigeria's foreign policy has had? Well, look, what, again, going back to the setting, you know, um, the anti-apartheid struggle and the fact that uh, our desire at that time was to ensure that Africa uh, becomes free. And of course, with uh, the independence of uh, Namibia and uh, later uh, the end of apartheid itself, that aspect of our foreign policy that, uh, that wished to end uh, colonialism was practically accomplished. The establishment of ECOWAS itself is a big plus to Nigeria. And I'm sure that uh, you know the history of uh, ECOMOG, I mean, uh, ECOWAS after the, after the war in which uh, General Gowan at that time engaged with, uh, in a, uh, had the, a collaborator in Togo, President Nasingbe Eyadema. And both of them worked, you know, uh, to, to, uh, to establish the uh, economic community of West African state. That's in itself is a major, you know, achievement. And I remember the statement that Gavan made on his visit to London, when he told the British that as, as you, that's the British, as you are moving into Europe, Nigeria is moving into ECOWAS. And so that in itself, it's, uh, it's not just an impact, in the sense that uh, we, we, we began the process that today has accumulated in the establishment of the African continental uh, market. And the whole idea was to build a large, a very large economic uh, uh, environment around Nigeria that could you know, enable Nigeria to trade effectively with its African, uh, African neighbors. And so when you put, when you look at the totality of what has happened over the years, you begin to see the impact. We build a very strong relationship with the rest of the, the with the rest of the world. That, of course, you know, uh, post civil war, um, uh, acted in the in the in the interests uh, acted in favor of Nigeria. There was a time in this part. Uh, there was a time in this country that an only issue concerning Africa. Nigeria was consulted. And they, immediately Nigeria takes a position or backs a position. That becomes a, 
African position, and that becomes a position that the international community will respect in dealing with the African, uh, with, in dealing with the African, uh, African continent. So to a large extent, um, they were impactful in the sense that up to a certain point, we managed to maintain peace and stability in the region until um, circumstances compelled us to use force in places like Liberia and Sierra Leone. And again, the whole idea was to ensure the peace and stability of the West African region, and by a larger extension, the African region as well. And of course, you are aware of the fact that uh, in almost all crises in, in Africa, we've been involved in trying to find peace and accommodation among the warring uh, uh, partners, just like what we are trying to do today in Mali and in, um, in Guinea and uh, one or two other places you know, where democracy is failing. And we are involved in trying to encourage them to, to, to maintain the course, to continue to allow democracy to flourish. All right, let's take a look at the nation's claim to big brother role in Africa. Not all African countries recognize and appreciate this claim. You even mentioned it, the, when Nigeria comes into a conversation, their position is usually the one that the world recognizes when it affects Africa. What would you say are some of the arguments that are being put forward when some African countries say they do not recognize the big brother role that Nigeria is playing? You know, this has been um, a topical issue, a controversial uh, issue. And uh, I know quite a number of Nigerians feel uh, disappointed that in some circumstances, uh, some of the countries we have helped uh, do not understand, uh, I mean, do not um, uh, recognize uh, what we have done. But look, my position has always been that when you look at what has happened to other countries in similar circumstances, you find out that it, they have suffered the same thing. You know, I always make this joke that, um, uh, you know, when you hear the word Yankees go home, you know, with regards to America being asked to leave uh, territories where America actually went to help the people. And they, what did they get in return? It was for them to ask the Yankees to leave their own uh, respective countries. You know, a number of, second, a number of reasons can be adduced for, for some of these things. Um, you know, but one, one good example I can give you, for example, uh, while I was in Sierra Leone, we, we had, we had uh, received, we have received the, the backing of the Sierra Leone government, for example, you know, um, uh, for our candidates in, uh, in an international organization. I think it was the DG of the, I don't know whether it was the WHO or something, or something within the health sector anyway, but apparently unknown to the head of state, uh, the, 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 the Israeli Union Minister for, for Health had also been privately convinced and promised an appointment in that organization by, I think it was Japan or some other country. You know? And so the man was prepared to ignore his country's directives and voted you know, based on his own personal interest rather than on the interests of his own country as dictated by his government uh, policy. So you find some of these things that there are conflicting interests in, in some of these countries where uh, people do not recognize what we've, uh, what we've done. The other point, of course, is the fact that uh, in a number of these countries, because of the way, because of the way that we dispensed our aid, right? the people themselves, yeah, government, government, individuals in government are aware but the people themselves are not too, too uh, uh, educated or enlightened about what we've done for them. And, and, I, and, I, and I always cite uh, South Africa as a typical example. You know, during the apartheid regime, for example, it was against the law in South Africa to report on the ANC. So whatever we did for the ANC external, and remember that we were dealing with the ANC external, not ANC internal, was never reported in South Africa. 
So many of the people in South Africa, I'm not talking of the leadership, many of the people in South Africa, actually, they not even know, you know, um, a fraction of some of the things we, we, we did. And, and the way and manner we dispersed uh, this aid also, I think, contributed to the fact that uh, a, a number of people um, didn't actually know and as consequently, uh, did not, uh, you know, did not appreciate what we did. You know, in those days, anytime we give aid to some of these uh, countries, we never publicize them. We never made noises about them. We never went to, well, there was no CNN in some cases on this, but the truth of the matter is that in, in maintaining a very, very low profile, People in that country did not even know that we we're part and parcel of helping to solve their, you know, their challenges. So these are some of the some of the things um, uh, that went wrong. And of course, the, the other thing uh, is the fact that um, uh, part of that controversy is the fact that um, we are we were not engaging some of these countries enough at that time, or they were not align us to do A, B, C, D, you know. The truth that we must admit, very simple, at that time, we didn't have the capacity. We did not have the capacity, but today situation has changed. We now have the capacity to move in and do a lot of business. Yeah, we'll, 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 we will definitely talk a lot more, hopefully with time, talk about, you know, getting people involved in the process, because you just mentioned that the people didn't know the kind of assistance that Nigeria was bringing to them at the time. So that might have exacerbated their lack of appreciation of the role that Nigeria was playing. But staying with the big brother role, some scholars are arguing that in the face of you know, shortfalls in her management and running of the, uh, her own affairs in Nigeria now, for instance, uh, a former minister of foreign affairs, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, acknowledged late last year at um, an event, a think tank event, that what has changed in the country and had negative impact on her foreign policy is the fight against terrorism and Boko Haram. Put literally, <laughs> remove the tadpole in your eyes before looking at mine. What's your reaction to that? We have our own challenges for sure, but despite that, there are countries who still believe that they need the help of Nigeria or they need the assistance of Nigeria. Look, we are capable. We have the resources to take care of ourselves and to take care of uh, countries that come for uh, some form of assistance like our neighbors. These are things that we cannot avoid because you need, friendship is not something you build just for one day or for one occasion. Well, but, but Nigerians, you know, you know, Niger a, lot, a lot of Nigerians would argue with the fact that foreign policy um, investment, well, let me use the word now, investment, is capital intensive. And then you have poverty at home. And then you're spending a huge amount of money in helping others achieve certain things. So it wouldn't it be better to address your own problems than uh, when you have gotten no, to let, a let, level let, 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 let of me, stability? Let me, let me answer this this way. Let me answer this this way. As I said, we have the capacity, we have the resources to be able to manage our affairs and manage our, exter our external obligations. If we run our affairs in Nigeria uh, efficiently, effectively, and uh, transparently and an accountable manner. There is no country today in the world to other countries, particularly the big powers that do not have their own challenges. And they continue to help. The those that you are referring to should ask themselves, why are these other countries, in spite of their own challenges, in spite of the poverty in their own countries, why are they still providing assistance and help to other countries? It is simply because they realize the fact that they need to maintain this relationship, that they need to ensure that in those countries that you are, you are trying to neglect, that they do not even start another crisis that will affect your own, uh, that will affect your own country. Look, it's like the argument that is being made today about the vaccine uh, thing uh, for COVID-19. Uh, 
for COVID-19. You know, what part of the world cannot claim that it's going to vaccinate itself alone and leave the rest of the world? No, it was a mistake we made in the first, uh, you know, uh, first time around. And it has come back to what the, the rest of the world that today, in the sense that today we are now having another, um, another version or variant of uh, COVID all over the place and the whole world again is affected. So it is inevitable that once you have this, the capacity, the ability to help, particularly your neighbors, particularly the African countries. Look, there are some countries, if Nigeria has not been helping them, the, the, the situation there would have been worse. There would have been more crisis. that will even demand more resources from us and other West African countries uh, to, to, to solve. So the problem is not whether foreign policy is capital intensive. The problem is not whether we are, you know, we are spending resources in other countries. No, my argument remains, we have enough resources to be able to take care of our own internal uh, issues, as well as spend some building friendship, building our own security and our own uh, survival in terms of the global uh, environment. All right, but let's go on a short break. When we come back, I'd like to stay with that aspect of the conversation, but looking at it in a global perspective, how Nigerian citizens are treated. Africa is rising. Again, we hear our sounds echo on the other side. Afrobeats and Afropop reinvented, hip life brought back to life, new energy infused into Kwaito and Quella. Africa is balling. Every stroke, every shot, every race, we find our place at the top. Taking the helm of real power, new hopes for democracies. A breed of entrepreneurial tigers, audacious storytellers, and a promising generation raring to go. Truly, Africa is rising. And this is where the stories that define our continent live. Good to know you're still with us. This is one slot on New Central. We're looking at Nigeria's Afrocentric foreign policy. We're taking a review of the role, the big brother role that she has played in the continent. And my guest remains Ambassador Joe Cashe. Now, despite the role being played with her policy, respect and foreign image has seems to be deteriorating as citizens of Nigeria are constantly molested, sometimes harassed, unjustly detained, or even killed abroad. Some argue that Nigeria's utilization of her human and material resources for the greater good of the African state is not rewarding and of very little gratitude. He has spoken about that earlier. But the bottom line of this analysis is that people of the country are asking for a review of Nigeria's foreign policy. Do you agree? No amount of review of Nigerian foreign policy will stop Nigerians from traveling overseas. I hope that's number one. Number two, because we are going through uh, uh, a number of economic challenges in particular, a number of Nigerians have also left this country, believing that they can uh, find um, uh, was that uh, uh, they, they, some some have left for the Golden uh, Fleet. Some have also left to find a uh, 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 better life in, in other countries. Some have been successful. Some have just uh, some have not been successful, and some have, of course, uh, run into quite a number of, uh, of challenges. But one thing you need to know, people will continue to travel you know, around the world. And um, 
The only thing that has compounded our own case, and it depends on country by country, and we have to be country specific when we are discussing these, uh, these issues. If you take the challenges Nigeria is facing uh, in, in a number of a Asian countries, it's because of the fact that uh, quite a number of Nigerians in that part of the world are engaged in nefarious activities. They are engaged in drugs. And look, for example, Thailand, it is very clear as soon as you get into Thai, uh, Thai airport, and it's somewhere within there that uh, penalty for drug trafficking is death. So when you hear that quite a number of light number of Nigerians going uh, in a prison uh, in China, Thailand, in a, where again, in a, a number of countries in that part of the world, it is because of these uh, activities. Then you also have those who have challenges in terms of trade, like in Ghana. And the problem with those one is that, and then to a large extent, South Africa. What happens in these countries, and indeed around the world, is that as soon as the economy of a country goes down, and foreigners are, you know, look, when foreigners go, when people go to another country to work, they actually do work. They actually become more innovative they actually suffer themselves. They, they sacrifice themselves in order to be successful. And so that drive, you know, that drive, that hard work, you know, earns them a lot of um, uh, profits. Uh, let me put it that way. And this sometimes creates jealousy among the citizens of that country. Some, of, some countries, I must say, their citizens are lazy. So they see foreigners coming and doing well. And anytime the economy goes down, in fact, the governments also contribute with their own language. So it, the, the successful or the hardworking foreigners become the target for the failure of the government of that country. So that's another thing we must recognize. It's not as if anybody gets up one day and decide that, oh, we hate Nigeria, we hate Nigerians, we are going to drive Nigerians away. No. It, it's an it's an economic it's an economic thing, and that we must uh, you know rec recognize as well that it has only to do with um, Nigeria's foreign policy being weak or strong. No, it has nothing to do with it. So I always say this at any given time. Number one, you know, when people go out, my appeal to them all the time is: if you are going to engage in trade, please. Obey the, the, obey the regulations, obey the laws of the countries that you are going into. If you decide that you want to engage in drugs and you go and start taking drugs to Malaysia, to Indonesia, to um, Thailand, where it, the, once you are caught, it's death. It is clearly written out, written out in these countries. And so you cannot blame the Nigerian foreign policy for that. Because as far as I know, Nigerian uh, diplomats have done the best they can. They have pleaded, they have gone to court with these people, you know, but they keep making the case that no, they knew. In fact, as much as uh, I can remember, even at the point that we're handling some, um, uh, some issues in, in a place like uh, Thailand and uh, Malaysia, more Nigerians have been arrested. No matter what you say to those who want to go to these countries, it does not stop them from, uh, you know, uh, from going to this country. So it's it's not so much the fault of the government alone. Yes, look, even if tomorrow we become, uh, we our economy improves, our economy is, uh, uh, we have a, a GDP that is running at 10 percent, <laughs> and uh, there is a reduction in poverty. There are people who still believe that going to live abroad is what they want to do, and you cannot stop them. Okay, I, I want to ask you this before we move further. Um, some scholars at some point said, well, our policy has been around since independence, right? But our society has evolved over time. The Nigerian society has evolved over time. Some even said that while the foreign policy we had was very good and laudable in the 1990s, with the changes that we are seeing in the country, it is time for us to begin to take a look at our foreign policy. I'm going to ask you, with your many years of experience, what in your candid observation is lacking in Nigeria's foreign policy? 
do you think it is time for a review? Well, look, you are you are you are right to observe that um, a lot has uh, a lot has changed. Um, I, I just think that uh, we we have achieved the first. Let me just say the the first set of objectives that um, that we set out to achieve, and of course, has since changed. You know, particularly on the economic front and the fact that our population continue to increase. Yes. We need to devise a foreign policy that takes uh, into consideration these uh, these changes, and that's why I said to you, if in the 70s and the 80s we do not have capacity to engage Nigerians, do not have capacity to engage outside. Today, uh, Nigerians have that capacity to engage outside, and this is why that why you find out that in a number of African countries, for example, and beyond African countries, a number of Nigerians by establishing businesses in these countries and doing well. And my argument has always been that it was because of the foundation that was laid in the past that has made it easy for these Nigerians to be welcomed into these territories, you know, to do business and, and, and the rest of it. Of course, yes, there are changes and we must continue to evolve. We must continue to change our saints, you know, but the truth still remains that we need to bear in mind that there's a need for us to maintain good and friendly relationship with especially our neighbors. We must continue to, you know, to watch over what is happening in our neighboring countries and where necessary, where we can, you know, provide assistance if it's possible. Because the failure to do that could come back to hurt us, you know, one of, one of these days. And that's the whole essence of good neighborliness. You say, look, let me expand this conversation. There are a number of Americans who believe, for example, that the only way you can stand the tide in terms of uh, in terms of Latin Americans, everybody in Latin America wanting to get into the United States, is for the United States to help build the economies of those countries. So that those countries, you know, uh, who are today uh, uh, poverty driven, so that they can have enough to do and they will not be surging into the United States. It's an argument that is going on in the United States that America needs to do more in Latin America to help build the economy of that, of, of that region. And so reduce the number of people trying to get into America, you know, one way or the other. And we, you know, the same thing, we, the same argument we can make in this country that look, I, as long as we are who we are, as long as our economy is the largest in this part of the world, People are going to come and do business in this country. Not to, look, there was a day I flew one evening from um, uh, I flew one morning from uh, from Ghana. I was amazed to find out that we were, we were less than ten to fifteen Nigerians in an aircraft that was filled up with Ghanaians. They were coming to do business in Nigeria, and a number of them were going back later in the evening. So these these are things that is happening all over the world, not just uh, about. Uh, about Nigeria, I said. So we must keep an open mind to some of these things. Mm -hmm. We cannot be an island and we cannot live in isolation. We live in an, a, a global environment and we must bear that in mind in whatever we do in terms of our foreign policy. Yeah, you, you agree that, the, I mean, there should be some adjustment with the evolving times. So I'm oh, going to ask. Look, life is, life is full of adjustment. Life is full of adjustment, of course. So look, you, once we have finished one thing or the other, we move on to the next thing. And today, the focus is the, uh, I mean, uh, economic development. Africa itself is talking of improving African, uh, into African trade, which was not a strong issue in the, in the, in the, in the 80s, 70s, and the 60s. You know, so the, as, as issues change, we are just. So in what areas, we, we I, I was actually getting to the point of asking you, in what areas do you think that Nigeria's foreign policy should change or improve? Where should we be focusing a little more on? You've talked about the economy. Is there any other areas that you think that maybe a little more attention is required? Well, I, I, I think, first of all, I, I think one of the things that we, we really need to do today is to strengthen the machinery for foreign policy implementation. That is pay close attention to, 
uh, to the officers, to, to the people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because look, these are the diplomats you send out. Uh, the machinery for foreign policy must be must be strong and effective, and the and the people that you bring into the uh, into the foreign ministry itself must have that capacity to conduct negotiation. Must have that capacity, you know, to negotiate um, uh, on behalf of Nigeria around the world. They must understand what is at stake. They must appreciate, you know, uh, the drive and what the country itself wants to wants to do. And so once you strengthen that capacity of the, of the operators of the policy itself, and once government policy is very clear, very clear to everybody, I, I, I think that um, our foreign policy going into the future will, be, uh, will just be adequate for the country itself. Um, let, let's, let's just clear doubts around this. Uh, let me put the question to you. How does um, the foreign policy affect its citizens? Because in all of this, We've not talked about what the citizens of Nigeria benefits from the foreign policy that Nigeria currently operates. So could you just maybe clear doubts about what Nigerians are getting from the foreign policy that Nigeria has? That, 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 is, that, is, uh, that is a question that is asked all over the world by citizens of uh, one country or, or, the, or, the, or the other, that what do they benefit from this country? And, and uh, operators, you know, have always said that what we do, they 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 building a very good relationship with one another, maintaining peace and stability around the world, you know, creates creates the environment that enables Nigerians to go in and out of, you know, Nigeria or to go from one country to the other with minimum, you know, with minimum ease. It opens up doors of opportunities, you know. Look, if you are banned, for example, from going to one country, as, as uh, people protested when there was this uh, uh, COVID yeah. ban and things like that, you saw the protests that, uh, you know, that took place, not just in our country here, but all over the world, because people want to move around. And part of the confidence that they have is that their country has a very good relationship with country A or with country B. You know, that's uh, one. The second thing is that for our own survival, as long as we do not yet have the technology and the capacity to do a number of things, we also depend on a number of countries for the vast. In fact, you know, you know, we are an import dependent country. And so that means that we actually have to behave ourselves in terms of dealing with the rest of the world so that some of the critical things we, we need are not denied us in terms of uh, sanctions and the rest of it. The, es the whole essence of foreign policy is, is, is to create you know, friendly relations among uh, nations. And by doing that, countries, countries, or countries of the world or people of the world, you know, certainly uh, enjoyed the benefits of your country maintaining friendly relations with another country. You know, there are countries that you can't go to, for example, you can't go to North Korea. You understand? You can't, you can't go to North Korea if you do not have a relationship with that country. And, and, and yet, if there are things that some Nigerians want from that particular country, look, if they can't go, it just means that uh, uh, something is wrong somewhere. And so this is where we are. So in, in, in having a foreign policy, it is to create you know, friendship around the world in a way and manner that will enable your citizens to be beneficiary of a global environment that recognizes the rights of the people, you know, to travel and live anywhere they, they choose based on the laws and regulations of each of the countries of the world. And, and so today, when you find, and I repeat this, whether anybody wants to agree or not, when you find uh, Nigerian businesses getting involved around the African continent in particular, is because of the fact that we have built that relationship in the past. We have established enough credibility that we want to be good neighbors. We have made the point that having Nigerian businesses in this country benefits those countries as well as benefits Nigeria itself. And this is why you know foreign policy is important. And of course, in terms of uh, it also means that um, Anytime there's crisis around the world, your country is there to negotiate and ensure that uh, nothing happens to a country like Nigeria or, or, or yeah, happens to, to Nigeria. That you are there. 
to wrap things up, I I'd like you to speak on what future you see for Nigeria's Afrocentric foreign policy. What? What future you see for Nigeria's Afrocentric foreign policy? Oh, look, <clears throat> I've always believed that if we get things right in this country, if we have a domestic environment that is peaceful, if we have a domestic environment that is productive, very, very productive, if we have an environment in which we have a very strong security architecture, our army is very strong, our police is very effective, our customs and, you know, they are operating in, 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 a, in a clearly defined environment that is characterized by uh, integrity, efficiency, and, and they are effective. That this country within the international community will be highly respected and its voice will even grow stronger or be stronger when it speaks within the international arena. That's how you gain respect. And when you have that, when you gain that respect, that respect also translates to your own people themselves. Look, there, there was a time in this, in my lifetime, and I think many people will admit to that if they want to be honest. We all admired the Americans. Why did we admire the Americans? Because of the, because of the achievement they've made and their capacity or ability to protect Americans anywhere in the world. And so an American goes out with that confidence that my government is strong enough to protect me anywhere in the world. They go out with that confidence that they, the people of America, not just that America is the largest economy in the world, even then and today, but that is providing the world so many things in terms of innovation, you know, and uh, products. That once upon a time, Japan was like that, and today it is China. Uh, he was just making his uh, final submissions before that happened. Um, I just hope that you were able to get uh, the point of this conversation. We need each other. Partnership is the way to go for Africa to grow. We must be our brother's keeper in spite of our very individual challenges. And that's a wrap on One Slot today. Join us again for another engaging conversation next time. From myself and the team of One Slot, many thanks for your kind attention and bye for now.